is Russell Muldoon from the Montgomery Fund and David Novaks from Wealthwise Edu Education. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thank you. Excellent. Russell, what are your thoughts mm. on the market at the moment? Yeah, interesting. I mean, we're, we're effectively back to where we were two years ago. So the index has come down to levels we saw back in Ju June, July in 2013. And, you know, that's, that's an issue with, with the market, with, with our market in particular, because we are so heavy in the banks and the resources, you know, to combine, they still make up 50, 50, 60 percent of the index. So the index is really dictated on, you know, as David was saying, what the banks and, and what resources are going to do. You know, we've been very, very negative on resources since 2013, continue to be, and they still have a very hefty weight. I think they're still about 18 percent of the index. The banks now make up the lion's share. Um, so, you know, that's obviously going to be a heavy, heavy weighing on the market, you know, at least for the next probably five to ten years. Um, you know, do we get a Christmas rally? Don't know. Can't predict that with any uh, degree of confidence. But um, and you know, if so, we've got a bit of an issue in terms of we think mining is going to continue to be under pressure, mining shares in particular. Um, and in, in terms of the banks, you know, APRA is is really uh, clamping down on lending practices well, the and liquidity, practice. and they're trying to slow things down. So what you see is their share prices have pulled back because the growth outlook for the banks has now slowed from you know mid to, to high single digits to probably uh, flat to, to very low single digits. So they, they've come back. So, you know, the growth outlook for those two parts of the market, the, the lion's share of the market, are looking a bit thin at the moment. But, you know, um, virtually no one is invested in the entire market. But mean? the banks have tried to compensate for that little lack of growth a little bit by putting mortgage rates up a bit. Um, independent of the Reserve Bank, so trying to improve their margins a little bit. Do you see that as giving them a little bit more growth over the next 12 months? Oh, look, you know, banks are certainly more leveraged to recovery and margin versus growth. So, you know, you've got billions of dollars of assets sitting on a book, so if you rise, re reprice that by 10 or 20 basis points, you know, that's, that's a huge uplift versus if you grow your book by $100 million or $200 million, you know, the, the impact is, is multiples versus the growth they can get. So, yeah, and, you know, because of the the, the additional capital that the banks need to hold, the, the, the APRA is trying to ensure that they remain profitable. And I think we're also going to see a rate cut coming. So the banks are also positioning uh, their funding costs ahead of a rate cut. So if we get a 20 basis point rate cut, you know, you're going to see some of that margin come out. So it doesn't, it's, it does't, yeah. doesn't go both ways. But so I'll quickly, yeah. Russell, any themes that you've Yeah, well, look, our funds uh, over the last 12 months are up about 12 percent, and the market's negative one to, to, to the end of October. Or, yeah, to the end of October. So we've outperformed by a good 11-12% over the last 12 months. So we've actually recorded growth. And we've done that by not being you know, an index hugger and hugging resources and hugging the bank shares. You know, we're heavily underweight the banks because of the growth outlook. And we have focused on you know, the areas where we are going. So telecommunications, high-quality software as a service businesses, uh, high-quality internet companies. Um, you know, we've got a lot of those in our portfolio. And now we're starting to look at, okay, the currency is lower. It's, you know, we think it's going to go lower, maybe into the 60s at some stage. And it's certainly it's hovering around that 70 and looks like it's going to push through. So what happens when the currency goes lower? You know, you get a big uplift in like you just mentioned, you get a big uplift in, in tourism, for example. Um, education has been touted as one of the big export stories for the next five years. So, you know, there's, there's certainly some positive stories out there and some growth things. And you mentioned Bell and these Blackmores. You know, I, I can't get my head around, uh, you know, the upcoming demand yeah. coming from and valuations. I mean, the growth is just off the charts. Yeah. Um, but there are companies out there that are growing. I said to you, realestate.com.au, TPG, uh, Focus, M2. You know, you just got to look and you got to really dig for them. And well, you know. Hopefully we get some questions on some of those companies. Yeah, be What's your question? I've got two questions for yourself or the panel. One is, what does the panel think about Mesoblast as an investment for me to put in my super scheme? And the other question is, which of the four banks would they put some of their money into a super scheme pool? Okay. Good question, Ray. Thank you. Russell, Mesoblast, you've been following it recently? No, it's not one we um, unfortunately have. It looks like it's involved in stem cell research, and I don't know a lot about that field. Um, so that type of investment for a super fund, yeah. when you think about a super fund and what it's for, yeah. and it's a... Uh, it's um, so wealth preservation, yeah. capital growth, it shouldn't be a, a, a you know, punting tool. Um, so if you were to, you'd be looking at a small... Oh, uh, if I was looking, yeah, look, it'd be a very, very small very holding. Small I'm talking of half a yeah. percent of a super fund. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't 
put much weight on this at all. And the reason for that, you know, I'm looking at analyst forecasts here, the company hasn't made any money. Um, and it's only forecast has suddenly become profitable in 2018. So, you know, I'd want to have a look at behind that number and see what is going to, what's going to be this watershed event for this company in the next few years that's going to see these volumes, sales volumes for, for their product, their stem cells. So obviously um, a lot of research, a lot of costs involved in doing that before they actually become economically yeah, yeah. viable. I mean, I, I've heard quite a lot, of, and this was a two or three billion dollar company yes. there not long ago. Now it's coming back down to a billion. So that should yeah. tell you, you know, it's, it's probably taking a lot longer than what the market had expected them to become profitable. And even in 2018, consensus right now has them pegged at about 35 million after making 250 million dollars in cumulative losses in 2016 and 2017. So they're going to make two, two, lose 250 million, then they're going to make 35. Um, you know. Potentially in three years' time. To make more, but oh, yeah, hope been... to make more. Correct. Um, yeah. so, you know, it's, it's expensive at 1.2 billion if they can only do 35, but maybe they can grow and be a much bigger beast. Sure. Um, yeah. Look, it's a, to me just looking at it right now and not knowing what I don't know. And I don't know a lot about this business. Um, I, I'd say very small weight. Small if, if so any. the banks, though. Yeah. Which of the big four would you be looking at at the moment? Um, so we like CBA. Yes. And we like Westpac. Unfortunately, Westpac weren't ex dividend today. So if you're going to look at one, you're well, going to look at one. Fortunately, that's... unfortunately, whichever way you want to Well, I mean, for an investor wanting yeah. to, to buy a bank share today, um, you know, obviously it's ex dividend, the share price has fallen, so you can take advantage of that share price fall by buying a lower price. But you don't get, you know, in a super fund, you get the you fully franking, frank you want the franking, and you get the franked up yield, and you get a rebate. Um, you're obviously not going to get that for the next six months. So, you know, weighting of money argument, you probably look to maybe a CBA share or something like that if, if you were going to look to buy shares in banks. Okay. It, so. Russell, your thoughts? Yeah, look, I, I probably agree with you. I think I'm um, looking at the the, the P and L here, and they don't really make a lot of money. Um, you know, it is in a very sexy sector, so I think you're going to have a lot of demand for these businesses for for quite a while. I mean, uh, the China trade of our retail trade figures were a billion dollars within the first hour. You know, and a lot of that would be this. Uh, baby food formula, which these guys do, A2 Platinum. So, you know, they, they offer that product, but it's only a small part of their, their revenue at the moment. The revenue is growing very, very strongly. But if you have a think about this business, right, they have to source milk from the farmers, mm. and the farmers sell the milk based on the commodity price, right? So they basically have to pay whatever the commodity price is. Um, so their margin, their ability to get margin out of a rising milk price is, is very, very limited. Mm. So they've got to convert that into milk, into yogurt, into butter, into cheese, into you know, baby milk powder. And that baby milk powder is very, very sexy right now. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's only a small part. And sure, you know, they're, they're adding a lot of value with that uh, baby milk powder in, in terms of IP and ability to, to make a high margin on that. But for all their other products, it's very, very low margin. So it's not like a pure play like a Bellamy's or a Blackmore's, which, you know, they're, they're adding a lot of IP and they're adding a lot of, uh, a lot of value add to a raw material. These guys are, uh, you know, effectively producing commoditized products. So, you know, but in the meantime, you know, with the market loves it, and I, I said at the sh uh, start of the show, with our AUD being lower and likely to go lower, um, there's going to be a rebalance of the economy towards uh, agricultural uh, products. Um, there's going to be a huge demand coming in for the, you know, because our products going to be cheaper. Education and, and tourism, they're three main sectors which are going to continue to do well. And there's a lot of smart people out there. You look, saw Jerry Harvey out there buying a, a, a cow farm the other day, a dairy farm using uh, Harvey Norman's balance sheet. So, you know, there's uh, uh, Blundy up in the NT, he was on 60 Minutes not that long ago. You know, he's, Andrew Forrest as well. Yeah. They're investing a lot of money and they're, they're smart people. So, you know, I think they're saying that, yes, the economy needs to rebalance and is rebalancing and will rebalance to agricultural products. So these companies are in the right space. Um, I, I just think you need to be selective and, you know, this thing could go up. You know, even, even, even that doesn't make any sense. I think that's I mean. good. Everyone knows that, 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 you know, food and agriculture is potentially going to be the next big thing, particularly with this free trade agreement from China. And everyone yeah. knows that, you know, our clean and, and uh, efficient food mm. products are what people want. Mm. But at the same time, you can't get caught up in every company's not going to make you know a lot of money out of out of that free trade agreement. And there's a bit yeah. of time before you know the real effects of that will flow through. Yeah, but I mean, you, know, you mentioned the balance sheet being a bit distressed. And they've now repaired that with a capital raising. Yeah. So they've got some working capital to, to invest in more product, get more product out there, get it saleable, get it ready, or get it ready for sale, get it out to market. So you know you should see their you know, assuming the demands there, which it looks like there is. Sure. Um, you know their product sales should should go up, and they're up pretty significantly in the first year. They're I mean, they're up 40 percent. So, but there's just no margin. I mean. All right, thanks for the question, Eric. Russell, you've been Three put questions. on the spot, mate. Three I've questions and only one. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, uh, tip, we'll, we'll start with the last one first. Yeah. Um, TPG did a big capital raising today. They raised $300 million. You know, they said uh, they're going to pay down some debt and use that money to, to invest in some capex or some fiber infrastructure that they're building for Vodafone. They announced that you know, about a month ago. Um, I think there's a, there's an underlying strategy there. They they need the money, sure. Their balance sheet is pretty stretched. Um, but it's a high cash flow business, high quality assets, so they can afford to run that debt level. I think um, they're going to potentially try to block the MCU Vocus merger, which yeah, I don't want to see. I actually I, I actually hope there's going to be a little battle there because we own both of those. We don't own TPG at these prices. So I think the capital raising at these these levels is probably telling you what David Teo is thinking about his share price. Um, we you don't find think it you hard. might make a play at Vodafone. No, I don't think so. I don't think Vodafone's up for sale at this point in time. There's been a lot of rumour about Vodafone. Everything's for sale at the right price, though, isn't it? Yeah, it, really? it is. But I, yeah, and they're, they're, they've come out publicly and said that certain assets are going to be for sale as they refocus their, their global group. Um, but look, they're, they're, they've committed with TPG to, to rolling out this fibre infrastructure to prepare for 5G. Mm -hmm. um, so look, you know, they're, they're, they look like they're here for the long term. So I think there, there's a bit of a battle coming for MTU. So we, we, we're a holder of both Focus and MTU, not TPG at these prices. Um, we just think it's a little bit expensive. And look, we've done a, a material amount of work over the last four weeks on TPG and trying to make it work. And we really considered the capital raising today and whether or not we participate and we didn't participate. Um, so in terms of the other telcos, you know, we're probably, as I said, prefer Focus and MTU. You now, in terms of um, car sales, yes, their balance sheet is a little bit stretched. They've made some pretty significant international investments. Could they have a, a tip? Um, well, we're seeing real estate come out and have a, a crack at IPP. You know, that both of these businesses are aggressively growing internationally. So it makes sense for these guys to, you know, Australia is an island, we have 22, 24 million people, I figure what it is, it keeps on going up all the time and every time. Got to get critical mass in that. Yeah, well, we're just, we get mature, right? And you can see that in the growth rates with car sales. If you've gone from 20 to 15, it's going to be some high, high double digits and probably going to come down to a lot of single digits. Mm -hmm. So the growth rate is starting to stall. So, you know, they've gone out and they've bought some international assets. And, you know, they're probably a good five to ten years behind where Australia is, so there's a long road ahead if they get that right. So it makes sense for them to continue to reinvest money in that part of the market where they're immature and there's a long growth rate. So yeah, we like car sales. Um, we do own it in one of our funds, um, but uh, I think it's about 3% weight, so it's not a huge holding at the moment, but great business. It's got a you know, dominant market share position, high cash generative. It's great, you know, investing significantly overseas if they can replicate what they've done here. Very few businesses can replicate their models in Australia to, to global markets. There's only been a handful of companies that can. But I think internet and online shopping and you know, well, just by advertising, it's... Better yeah, opportunity to replicate them. They're just lists, yeah. right? They're just lists of cars, they're lists of <coughs> houses, lists of, you know, on eBay, a list of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it, it's certainly one of those businesses that lends itself to replication in overseas markets. So, you know, we own REA, we own car sales, we own those, those types of businesses. Okay, and Eric had a little bit of a twist in there. Would you Iris or car sales? Uh, yeah, I think Iris is a, is a very mature business in Australia. It's not yeah. the same sort of growth you expect. It's yet. not the same sort of growth. Great business. Yeah, very sticky systems. But, you know, I, I look at this, you know, I use Iris at work, and I look at their systems compared no. to a Bloomberg, and I look at Bloomberg, and I see the amount of money they're pumping into their software, and I see the, you know, the progress they're making, and Iris just doesn't really change. You know, it's a, it looks like the old Excel versions from, you know, 15 years yeah. ago. <laughs> So, look, I, I think there's, there's going to be, there, there's, there's been a time and place for that business. Um, and that at the moment, they have very, very high market share. They have very sticky customers, very good cash flows, and that's enabled them to go over to the UK and try to get some growth. But again, they've gone to the UK and they've, they've bought some very, very big businesses in the UK, which again, mature. Yeah, so I don't understand that strategy. When you're looking for growth, you, you go over and you buy big businesses. And they've, they've announced one just recently as well. Um, so in, in, in my bet, you know, I think probably a car, car sales, sales over on nice. RS. Mm. No. I think that's what the market's having an issue with, is, is, is what are their real earnings. You know, I, I, when, I'm, when I'm looking at an investment, I always ask myself, is this business relevant you know, to the economy? Is it relevant to consumers? And everyone I ask about Dick Smith, so do you ever go into a Dick Smith? And they go, no, no, I've, I've got no need. No, I'll go to JB Hi-Fi or I'll go to Big W or you know, I'll go to Target or go to something like that. You know, I, I never go to a Dick Smith. I actually went to a Dick Smith just to have a bit of a look um, when they floated. And all I wanted was a little Bluetooth keyboard to hook up to my smart TV so I could, you know, you can type in searches on Netflix or something to look for a, for a movie. 
And I said, yeah, it's a very simple keyboard, and everyone who's an electronics store should own it. And I said, do you own it? Or do you have it in stock? And he goes, no, go to JB Hi-Fi. And I went, well, yeah. <laughs> they sent you to JB Hi-Fi. They sent me to JB Hi-Fi. And I, well, I know if I'm going to be invested in a, you know, a cyclical retailer that's mature, then my pick is going to be JB Hi-Fi. Yeah. yeah, and I think you know, investors have to be very concerned and very careful when things come out of private equity because there's a lot of ways that accounting can, can cover up. For, for a lot of things, purchase price accounting, uh, acquisition accounting. There's, there's a lot of ways that people can play with the books. And, you know, these guys bought it from, from Woolies, obviously, for 30 cents in the dollar. And what that effectively enables to do, so if you, if you buy, and effectively you're buying an inventory business, right? It owns 400 stores. Um, they're all leasehold. They're not asset on, on the balance sheet. The biggest asset's inventory. But if you pay 30 cents in a dollar, what are you going to do? You're going to try and sell that as quickly as possible, right? You, sell, you buy it for 30 cents and you can sell it for a dollar. You make really good margins. So your profits are inflated. You, know, you look really good for a very short period of time until you have to replenish that inventory at, at market prices and then try to earn the same sort of margin. They didn't own it for very long either, did they? No, they got it very quickly. So yeah. the, it, Woolies invested a lot in inventory, trying to beef up the stores. Private equity saw that as an opportunity to buy that asset, which they couldn't make work for 30 cents in the dollar, sell that inventory very, very quickly, get it out, get it to market on returns, in, uh, margin returns on product which are unsustainable, which appear to be unsustainable. That's why we're seeing a share price reaction. You know, and then they've come massive capex, so the cash flow has been pretty poor in the business as they had to replenish the inventory levels. Um, and now going forward, they've got all new stock on the balance sheet. But that stock is not purchased at 30 cents a dollar, it's purchased at a dollar. Um, so they're competing with, you know, UJB hi fis again and again. Um, so the margins are. they got more purchasing there. power as well. Uh, yeah. oh, I think both of them, you know, yeah, purchase a good amount of stock. So I don't think that's really the issue. I think, you know, who's been run the more efficient and by the more competent retailer, and we think that's probably JB hi fi Yeah, so look, I, you know, earnings are just a very hard unknown. It's such a moving feast. Um, how much margin can they get on their product? Yeah. All right, what are we looking at? Very good. Russell. Interesting little business. Yeah, it's not just here that uh, we're going to see boom in tourism. It's also, and we have seen a record number of inbound uh, Chinese coming into our market. There were some statistics out just last week. Um, but it's also happening in New Zealand. So we we're looking at a little company called Tourism Holdings over in New Zealand. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a bit too small for the fund and a bit of liquid. But you know, if investors can invest in the New Zealand market, you should have a look at that. Yeah, they basically got you know, the little caravan, camper vans you can yeah. drive around. And yeah, yeah, that's company, yeah. New Zealand has such fantastic scenery, so many places to go, everything's so short. That's a huge industry over there, you know, billions of dollars. So, and they, they dominate the space. Um, and their share price is just going parabolic at like that. So we think they're very well positioned. Um, they've got very good, strong earnings growth. And I don't think they're priced excessively. So, you know, unfortunately, it's just a little bit too small for us. So that's one you could look at on, a, on another market. Um, we mentioned agriculture, tourism, education. Now, it's been an absolute horrible place to invest <laughs> on the ASX. You've know, you got the, the vet fee help providers, and you're seeing, we're seeing some shockers come out there with vocation. Um, we're seeing some issues at the moment with um, Australian Careers Network, ACO. Um, what was the other one? Ashley Services. You know, we're, we're, it's just littered with uh, people who the government have cracked down on or are cracking down or perceived to be cracking down on. We're still waiting for the outcome for ACO, obviously. So it's been a very, very tough space to get exposure to its education. And there's other businesses like Navitas, which we mentioned you know, during the break, uh, quite mature businesses and, and losing contracts where the big universities big think they can do themselves. One that's coming to market is, uh, is a company called IDP. I don't know if you know, guys know IDP. about it. IDP. Um, IDP. It's not listed yet. Okay. It's, uh, the book bill was done today. It's coming out of Seek. So Seek. Uh, own this I was going to mention Seek because they're moving into the education, so they're spinning that out. So they? They, they, they want to focus on their online classifieds, right. so they're, they're, they're spinning out their, their non-core assets. They, they bought this business well, was, wasn't doing much, used the power of Seek uh, management and, their, mm. and their, their global reach, and they've grown into, you know, it's a, it's a very big business, and it'll probably be, have a market of about 600 million, so and we've tried to pick up some stock in that one. Now what they do is they do, uh, most of the earnings come from uh, when someone's looking to come into an English-speaking country you have to do an English speaking test you have to get yourself up to speed yep. so you can you know you have to show to a university they can do the course so there's about 2.3 million of these tests done annually around the world wow. 
big mm. business and growing strongly like the market's growing at high single digits. Right. So we think that's going to tick up and probably it's in an upgrade cycle as more people are going to look to come to mm. Australia, America, England, you know, that's just growing at a rapid, rapid rate. Um, so so we think that's are offloading this, are they? They are, yeah, to focus on that. Are they going to have uh, any, any percentage uh, holding in that? Uh, don't know, don't know. Uh, look, if it was at, came out of the top end of the range, there was rumours that they would sell all the holding. Um, if it came out of the bottom range, they'd keep some, right. but they may still keep some at the top end of the range. Yeah, they're basically exiting. Um, the other uh, owners are the universities. There's about uh, I think there's about 30 universities in Australia um, that own the other 50%. So that's a good sign. It's not, it's not going to be a Navitas where the university is going to pull out because this is a profitable business and they get dividends from it. Um, but what uh, so on the other side of the business, they, they've got the English, from the English testing, they've got the placement side. So they'll pick up people wanting to come into Australia and they go, well, where do I go? I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, which university do I go to? Which one has the, you know, the, the best reputation and the best outcomes for students? Mm. Can you place me? And so they'll get a placement fee. And those placements are also growing very, very strongly. So we think this is a business very well placed mm. um, for at least the next five to ten years. And, and certainly in an upgrade cycle with the Aussie dollar where it is. So, you know, We've bid very strongly into that book, okay. and I think that will trade very well when it comes to market. Well, there we have a couple of opportunities to potentially take advantage of. Uh, right. Yeah, well, and the, the flip side to that is if they, you know, it's it's one for set, 1.7, so it's hugely dilutive, and it's actually yeah. I'm looking at here 385 per share. The issue is 385 is the issue, yeah. So you know you can expect it to be around that sort of level when it opens. Um, market will sell it, make a bit of a profit or arbitrage, whether or not that's five cents, ten cents, whatever it is, it's a big raising. Um, so the market will try to get some money out. Um, so we'll settle around that four dollars, maybe even lower. You know, Blue Scope Steel, when they did their raising, and went below the issue price very quickly. So Part of the capital raising too is a, a, a key investor of mm. $500 million at yeah. $6.80 as well. So yeah, okay. you've, got, you've got a key investor there prepared to pay $6.80, mm. albeit they are entitled to the rights issue That's as true. well. So it brings their price down to a, somewhere around the 570 I think. Or 530, five, yeah, yeah. Out, yeah. yeah. Somewhere around there anyway. But, you know, they're you're prepared to take the risk and yeah. you know, put some money but, into yeah, that price. I mean, investors have to look at the flip side if you are there that this company may have not have been around if they couldn't get access to this capital. Yeah. You know, it could have been zero. So rather than zero, it's you know, going to be four dollars or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it looks like to me, if, if I look at that balance sheet now, it's progressed. It looks to me like they've tried to use their balance sheet to trade themselves out of trouble. So they've tried to, you know, use debt to fund their capex and fund their operations and hopefully during the time you know, they're doing that the oil price bounces and they make cash flow again. And they well they do become cash flow positive. Obviously. Just quickly what are your thoughts on BHP as well? No look we've been saying so since so, 2013. Yeah. Um, price reaction yeah. today doesn't mean anything. It's, it's going lower over the next two three years. Yeah. You don't need to be there. We think oh, iron oil prices are going to settle you know, potentially forty, thirty dollars. Yeah. Um, there's huge supply coming on. Demand is waning. Demanding is, demand is very weak, particularly out of China. Everyone's been expecting dem demand to grow five, ten percent to soak up this extra supply. It's not going to happen. No. So there needs to be a huge shakeout, and that shakeout hasn't happened yet. We're seeing a bit of M&A activity. People are getting together to get scale. People are saying, oh, it's the bottom of the cycle. People are getting together, but we don't think it is. You know, commodity cycles are very, very long and protracted. And there's been, never been an event like China that built up in China. Um, and, and there's not another country out there that can replace it. Replace it, yeah. Um, so it's, it's lower for longer. I, uh, I, I, uh, Russell, I guess that your opinion would be very similar to David's on this one. I know a lot of smart people who run hedge funds, and some of those hedge funds have this as one of their biggest shorts. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've got 50 million bucks on the balance sheet at their, their full year. They've got a lot of promise. They're doing a lot. But they're also burning through a lot. So they, they went through last year nearly $200 million. So $40 million gives you a quarter. And they need to come back to the market at some stage to you know, raise billions potentially over the life of you know, the construction of these assets. And investors uh, start to get sick of that when you keep coming back to the handout. Yeah, I mean, if the opportunity is there and they can show that these assets are needed and they can generate a good return, you know, the investors are going to be there. But I just think in, in this environment where we're seeing commodity prices depress right across the board, it's, it's a very a tough environment to raise capital and raise it yeah. cheaply. Um, so they're going to pay through the nose to, to get it. And so the amount of shares they're going to have to issue, the amount of debt they're going to have to take on, you know, it's just a very risky proposition. Yeah. Um, it's just easier, okay. easier things out there good. for us to invest in. So, gentlemen. Yeah. Where do we think this market is going to go? Are we going to have a Christmas rally? Or we always get a Christmas rally. We always get a, everyone's we always get a Christmas rally. Well, uh, not every year, <laughs> <laughs> well, 